Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome in this wonderful event. Welcome in the second international conference on education. It is my privilege and pleasure to be here today as the founder and president of the Communication Institute of Greece, an international association of academics, researchers, and PhD students, creating a community of more than 300 ambassadors from 38 countries around the world. Life has been challenging for us all these past two years. Apart from the health crisis, we actually see many Mediterranean and other countries burning, mainly because of climate change, but also because of people that do not understand the consequences of their actions. We are all actually devastated by the fires burning in Europe, North America, and Russia. Though many of these countries, including Greece, are used to summer fire seasons, climate change is making the hot, dry conditions that allow fires to catch and spread more common and more intense. We are all praying for this catastrophe to stop and thank all the firemen and the volunteers that are actually fighting to save human lives. We would also like to thank all the countries that, that were able to send help during the times, Cyprus, Czechia, France, Slovenia, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Israel, Sweden, Ukraine, and USA. Concerning the conference now, we thank our ambassadors, international endorsers, conference leaders, and organizing committee for their commitment and help. This conference includes 48 research papers from 70 presenters coming from 13 different countries around the world. Canada, Singapore, China, Israel, Greece, Australia, USA, Italy, Norway, United Kingdom, France, and Albania. We also thank you, our dear conference participants, for being here, and we ask you to stay throughout the conference, as this is how interaction and exchange of knowledge can be accomplished. Of course, since this is a remote event taking place in Greek real time, we understand that there is an important time difference for some of the participants. This is why all conference sessions will be recorded with the purpose of sharing later on. The mission of the Communication Institute of Greece is to create a forum to meet and exchange experiences and ideas about the development of our discipline by the creation of common research projects, the organization of opportunities to exchange, share, collaborate, and the production of publication. Our vision is that we all, especially us academics, understand the importance of sharing, exchanging, collaborating, communicating, and act together for a better future, a better world. Via this international event, we have the opportunity to discover or rediscover the importance of collaboration, exchange, and sharing. Simple things that we might take for granted seems to be the most precious ones. Health, empathy, positivity, authenticity, inspiration, love. Each of us educators has the privilege and the duty to become an example for our students, our colleagues, our families, the world. This conference is organized into 18 different sessions that include issues such as innovation in education, teaching methods, innovative action towards a sustainable educational system, teachers evaluation, education in the new era, leadership and management in education, and others. Addition, additionally, the community exchange sessions are created with a purpose to help us interact and share knowledge. At this point, I'd like to ask some of our honorary vice presidents that are here today. And maybe I'm not, uh, they were invited, I don't know if they're here, the deans of Beijing and Zhejiang University to say two work, words, starting by uh, Dr. Fotinidi Madidaki uh, from United Kingdom, our Vice President of Research and Academic Affairs, Associate Professional Education uh, in UK. 
Bhutini. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, really, thank you, everyone. It's so nice to be here, even virtually, to this uh, event. Um, really nice to see Evangelos, Jürgen, Arthur, Michael, Elvida. I hope more people will switch on their cameras so we can see each other and interact. Um, and Sophia, yes, good morning. Hello, Sophia from Australia. Um, I hope everybody is doing well, considering all the difficult circumstances. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to see such a varied program, uh, very stimulating intellectually. And I can't wait to, um, to participate, to discuss with everyone and to keep thinking and creating new knowledge. So thank you so much, Margarita. Thank you very much, Fotini. Thank you for everything. And uh, I will ask Dr. Michael Altamirano, Vice President of Strategic Management and Professor King Graduate School, Monroe College, USA, to say two words as well. Thank you, Margarita. Welcome to all the participants. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I, I love the topics that will be presented during this conference on education. Um, it, it is very well organized. I am a student in nature who happens to be an educator, and I cannot wait to collaborate with all of you over the next three days because my mind is open. Uh, I am empathetic to, to many of the topics that are being presented over the next three days, and I'm really excited to hear from everyone. And um, welcome on behalf of the Communication Institute of Greece. Thank you, Michael. Thank you a lot. And uh, now, Professor Sofia Karanikolas, Vice President of Learning, Innovation and International Relations, Honorary Associate Professor, University of Adelaide, Australia. Thank you, Margarita. And thank you to all of you who have joined us. Um, but in particular, I think I would really love to say a special thank you to Margarita, who really leads with so much passion and so much enthusiasm and kindness. And um, I personally am so looking forward to um, seeing all, some familiar faces, but also seeing some new um, faces that have joined us. And like Michael and Fortini said, it's such a wonderful opportunity to collaborate, to get to know one another and to share. I think in these current very challenging um, conditions that we all find ourselves in, it, it's really, really comforting to have other colleagues to be able to connect with, to share challenges and to also share strategies. So welcome everyone. And I'm looking forward to the next few days. Thank you so much, Sophia, from, from Australia and for all the, the encouragement that uh, you sent to us. Uh, uh, since I said at the beginning, uh, the Mediterranean countries and some other countries are facing uh, extreme difficulties. So uh, the important is to stay united and to try to inspire and give strength one, uh, one another. Dr. Jurgen Rudolf, Vice President of International Research, Development and Relations, Head of, uh, yeah, of Research and Academic Partner Liaison, Kaplan Higher Education, Singapore. Thank you so much, Margarita. It's a, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here and to, to see so many familiar and uh, friendly faces. And of course, also look, looking forward to, to meeting new people. Um, when I was going through the <clears throat> abstract uh, book uh, this morning, um, I, I thought of my um, a former professor and, and mentor who passed away a couple of years ago, um, because already in the uh, 1990s, um, and probably earlier than that, uh, he had this vision of uh, the, the former object of uh, anthropology, uh, you know, becoming the, the subject, of course, um, and, uh, and becoming ethnographers uh, that actually study the West. And um, when, I, when I was looking at uh, many of the, the topics uh, from our Chinese participants, uh, I, I thought uh, that his uh, vision has actually come true uh, because uh, they, are, they are studying 
some of the uh, American uh, educational topics. And I even saw um, uh, somebody from China presenting on uh, German education. Uh, so that's uh, certainly something I, I very much look forward to because I, I completely agree with my uh, former mentor uh, that this is very important uh, to, to have um, perspectives, um, you know, different unusual perspectives and uh, we, we can actually, uh, even if we are supposedly very, very expert on something, uh, learn uh, from, from these new and uh, different perspectives. And I think it's, um, the conference is indeed an absolutely wonderful opportunity to um, communicate with each other and to, to learn from each other. And uh, thank you so much to, to Margarita and um, the, the rest of the wonderful folks that have spoken before me. Uh, for making this happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Jurgen. Uh, I don't know if we have uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Yang Chen, uh, Assistant Dean, Faculty of Education, Beijing New uh, Normal University, China, to say two words. We might not. Or uh, do we have Professor Yue Khan, Vice Dean, uh, Zhejiang University, China, or Dr. Hao Ni from Zhejiang University? Okay. Hello. Hello. Uh, yes. yeah, I'm here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm Dr. Hao Ni, Hao Ni from Zhejiang University. And uh, also, um, I'm also the assistant uh, uh, editor of the journal called uh, uh, Entrepreneurship Education. And uh, I also will uh, deliver a speech tomorrow uh, in one session uh, about entrepreneur education. So I'm really hope all the uh, participants, if you are uh, focused on uh, innovation or entrepreneurship, you can have your um, speech uh, or your articles uh, submitted to our journal. And also uh, I'm so glad to join this meeting and I hope uh, uh, everyone can enjoy this big event. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Haoni. Uh, I will ask once again if uh, Dr. Yang Chen or if Professor Yue Kan were able to connect it. If not, I will continue. And maybe we will have the opportunity to see them uh, between some sessions. Okay, so I will continue. First of all, I will say uh, some uh, brief, I will, I will make a brief outline of some important details of our program for the day. So we really try to respect time. Presentations should give the main idea of our research and we have a maximum of 15 minutes to present and we keep questions, if any, for the end of each session. For the round table session and the poster session, we mainly focus on discussion and exchange. If you have been selected to chair a session, please remember that the most important is to be able to keep the time. For the parallel sessions, session leaders will be given the rights to record the session on their computer and then send it to us via Google Drive or another form uh, of uh, interactive method. We will uh, interact also via the chat where you can make comments, ask questions to the presenters, that the chairs and we uh, will collect and discuss at the end of each session. The important is the interaction we have. For that reason, we ask you to stay throughout this wonderful conference. It is tiring, we know. We, we all have a lot of remote lately because of the, the conditions we face. But uh, this is why we propose many music breaks to relax and stretch in order to become able to interact better. So uh, at the program, we had announced, uh, and there is a paper, a collaborative paper that was created uh, with uh, uh, the vice presidents of Coming at the time. Uh, so uh, Robert Bong, uh, myself, Georgian Rudolf, Otinidia Madidaki, Kalorin uh, Ricard Moreau, Sofia Karanikolas, uh, Paraskevi Kondoleon, Carl Hayes Bogner. Uh, for me, it's a must read, so you can download it. It is on the program. 
Uh, in this paper, we study the condition of pedagogy, examining the specific cases of seven universities in seven different countries, USA, Greece, Singapore, UK, Canada, Australia, and Denmark. Unlike a globalized response that would adopt one approach internationally, our study considers adaptations for local differences in a globalized set of responses in an attempt to identify new paradigms. Identified issues indicate shared threats across the seven institutions of higher education in this research. From a localized perspective, emergency responses at the curricular, institutional, and technological levels. First, changes to courses and curriculum must respond to emotional needs of students when transitional link from face-to-face -to, -face to online delivery. Second, the mission and value of higher education must indicate that institutions will recommit to faculty support beyond emergency remote teaching. And third, the needs of students and faculty must drive the choices of technology and not the reverse. Moreover, a localized synthesis of responses across all institutions and level identifies four themes. First, the disruption of the pandemic may lead to innovations in higher education. Second, the role of faculty is becoming redefined beyond content specific disciplines. Third, educational models must expand to include individuals other than traditional students and fourth rigorous pedagogical scholarship including leadership will point to the new educational insights the covid-19 pandemic will have a significant effect on higher higher education as distance education will be expanded more universities around the world will have to adapt obtain the, the needed techniques and technology, train educators, hire the trained staff, obtain the right educational resources. Educators who see the positive side can engage in the outcomes of what is actually being experienced. As dedicated researchers do the, during this pandemic, we have not only much to discover, but also many opportunities for reimagining our paradigm of how higher education. So some th uh, the ongoing tradition relies on three parameters, leadership, empathy, and structure. Whether we are leading at the government level for our university or in our classroom, no existing playbook prescribes the pathway for dealing with a global pandemic of this magnitude. Our local and global responses require leadership from us all that leverage a firm and steady presence, care and compassion for each other and prudent decision-making. Overall, our findings indicate that we stand at a crossroads rather than be defined by the pandemic let us seize this offered opportunity to transform higher education via innovative practices, authentic leadership, but most importantly, by empathy. Since we have uh, most of uh, the uh, authors of this excellent paper that I invite you to read uh, here at the conference, uh, I would like you to, if you have any questions, uh, about these themes, in, since we have uh, a little time before our uh, workshop presentation. Do you have any questions? Have you read? Have you, have you, did you have the possibility to read mm. this paper? Mm. Yes, Professor? Would any of the team of authors like to say something before we ask that we start the workshop? 
I'm, I'm happy to add something. Oh, for Dini, you go first. Okay, well, I, I just wanted to say that when we first um, got together as a team to write this paper, it was right at the beginning, I think, of the pandemic. And we had some hope that it wouldn't last as long as what it has. But I think one of the important things is, that has actually come out of this is that, you know, institutions for a long time have been really talking about the importance of delivering education in a more flexible manner. And people were always not sure about how to include the human side of teaching. So when you teach face-to-face, -face, you have that opportunity to connect. Um, but I think people have been very creative in being able to embed the human aspect of learning into remote and online and really create communities, learning communities online, which in a way, it's been a big challenge. In another way, it's actually enabled a lot of educators to reimagine remote and online learning. So it's, yeah, it's, it's been a learning journey, I think, for a lot of people. Thank you, Sophia. I think for Tini. Yes, um, thank you very much, Sophia, for, for this uh, insight. Um, I was looking at um, the last uh, slide you presented, uh, Marita, on um, uh, when you talked about uh, leadership, empathy, and structure. And um, it, as, as the pandemic went on, I was, I was and also uh, participating at the interdisciplinary workshop where we talked about leadership a lot and actually empathy with also the uh, presentation of Carling as well. I was, in my mind, I was thinking that there is a paradox between these two concepts, leadership and empathy. And what have we learned actually throughout the pandemic, moving on from the paper and understanding maybe the lessons that we can all take from uh, leadership initiatives, but also empathetic practices. One thing that I think um, throughout the pandemic, I found extremely important to nurture to, to the students who are all remote and most of them isolated which is also expressed in the paper, is this idea of empathy and working together uh, to create something new. And the fact also that uh, leadership is not only one person, but actually it's a community that creates leadership. So it's themselves who are co-leaders of whatever topic they are working on. Um, so um, I think these two concepts are so interesting right now and how they have evolved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fotini, and uh, it is true. And we have talked about collaborative leadership a lot uh, last week in the international uh, uh, conference in communication and uh, political science and uh, collaborative leadership and being together and acting as a team. Uh, is very important uh, to, to face difficult times uh, that uh, will continue to be there. Life is a challenge, so we should all uh, try to, to adapt and uh, be together. Yes, Jurgen? Thank you, Margarita. Um, yeah, and, and, and thanks for the excellent comments by, by Sofia and uh, Fotini. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to add, uh, it was a really, a uh, great experience um, uh, writing this paper to, together with the other co-authors. And um, it was kind of, for me personally, um, a part of the, the beginning of, of doing a lot of collaboration. And uh, I, I cherish this uh, collaboration a lot. So, so in, in case um, some of the fellow participants have not <laughs> written such papers um, uh, together before, uh, I would really encourage you to do so because I think we can we can learn a lot uh, from, from each other. And um, there, there's this word uh, that we are using in the paper, glocalization, which can be 
slightly confusing because it sounds a little bit like globalization, uh, but it is, of course, uh, the, the mix between uh, localization and, and globalization, uh, the mix between uh, standardization and uh, adaptation. Um, and uh, I think this is exactly uh, what is needed uh, because there, there are no cookie cutter solutions uh, that uh, can, be, can be perfectly applied uh, to, to other places. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they are they are obviously uh, best practices, and uh, like um, I think Sophia and Fortini already did. Uh, I would also and, and Margarita, of course. I would also like to um, uh, highlight the the human aspect. Uh, I think that's that's really the most important for us as uh, educators. So it's, it's not the the fancy, flashy technology uh, that we are using. It is the the authenticity and the integrity of the teacher, and uh, how they actually uh, communicate uh, with the with the students, and uh, then of course uh, how we apply this uh, to to various contexts um, can be very different right? from from country to country. But I think there there is some some essence that that can also be taken from this rather early effort. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Georgian. And uh, it is a fact that uh, the Communication Institute of Greece and uh, this conference and uh, ZALT and uh, all the partnerships and uh, different universities uh, that uh, are implicated, uh, is, it is the human factor that, that is the important and not the fancy other things. Uh, uh, and what I, I always say uh, it is not also the fact that we have uh, many diplomas or PhDs or it's how we react every single day and how we uh, let our human aspect uh, there and uh, uh, make it seen by our students as well, because this is what they need actually in hard times. Uh, to understand as well that we are all, also humans and we have the same uh, the same problems the, the same uh, things to discover as well so we that we are not gods and we do not know everything and we learn and we continue searching and also i, I would like to say that uh, collaboration uh, it's not an easy thing we, we make it uh, seem easy, but this is very difficult. And what we accomplished is, is excellent. And uh, we, this is why we encourage people and uh, especially academics in other universities to collaborate and to exchange. And this is a great experience. And we learn a lot from this. Uh, yes, dear Evangelos, a last question, but be, be a little bit brief because we will start uh, our workshop in two minutes. I just wanted to say, can you hear me? Yes. I just wanted to say that my comments come out of a very emotional experience the last few days with the disaster, the catastrophe here in Greece due to the fires. And I, I have been watching and trying to get news uh, from different sources and exercising uh, crisis and disaster communication. Um, friends, relatives, uh, authorities, and so on, about what is happening, especially to the area around my father's village on this island of uh, Euboea, Evia. Um, and going back to your comments just now about empathy uh, and about uh, leadership and about preparation for real life, I wanted to, uh, to really emphasize how education from kindergarten on uh, very often uh, is going down the wrong path. Um, and I, I would like to, as I said, emphasize approaches, didactic, pedagogical, to start with approaches that prepare uh, the graduates of kindergarten, primary school, secondary school, university, precisely for what they may face in life ahead. And here, I cannot escape thinking how problem-based learning is really appropriate to confront problems like what we are confronting right now in Greece and be prepared for it 
from tender age on. Thank you, and I'm sorry for, uh, well, one more minute, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, dear Vangelos. And we will uh, give the floor to our wonderful uh, professor academics, friends from Australia, uh, a workshop, an authentic assessment framework that fosters work readiness in students. Uh, I will let the, the presenters present themselves. Uh, professor Tanya Knotti, uh, uh, Professor Catherine uh, uh, Snellings, uh, sorry if I pronounce uh, bad, Professor Sofia Karanikolas, I can pronounce well Sofia's <laughs> name at least. <laughs> so we leave you the, the floor. Thank you. We can't hear you, Sophie. Sophia, we are not able to, to listen to you. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> it's good now. There we go. Okay, excellent. So I just have to try and find my presentation because. There we go. I was just going to say that um, what Evangelos just said actually leads into our presentation beautifully because mm. it is about delivering authentic learning to prepare really students for the world um, and not just for their workplace, I think, but I think it's to embed um, you know, how to be a global citizen, how to be responsible, how to be able to communicate and how to be able to um, collaborate, share knowledge and build one another. So we've called it an authentic assessment framework that fosters work readiness in students. And you can see there was a whole team of us. And very early in my career, I came across an African philosophy called Ubuntu, for those of you who have actually heard of it before. But it says, I am because we are. So we are all connected globally. We are all, whatever happens to, you know, one part of the world, it affects us here as well. So Margarita, we're thinking of everybody there who, um, and all the villages and all the parts of Europe who you know, are struggling at the moment. Um, and I need to sort of also say that whatever I've achieved in this world or even in my professional career is because of everybody else around me. So I just wanted to, to start off our presentation just to acknowledge the wonderful team that um, we were very fortunate to work with. So we're going to um, introduce our evidence-based uh, framework, which um, we sort of came together because we found this amazing authentic framework that was developed by two really well-known um, educators in Australia, Kevin Ashford Rowe and Jan Harrington. And I've had the pleasure of meeting both of those. And so we got together across disciplines and we thought, well, how can we further develop this framework to build this employability of work readiness in our own students. So together with Tanya and my colleague Kathy, we'll um, introduce that framework and then we'll present a couple of exemplars from both the School of Biomedicine, where Tanya's from, and from our dental school here in Adelaide, and then uh, get you also to share some of your experience as part of this workshop. So, what is this framework? Basically, it's a tool that we've been able to use to help, I guess, align what we do with our students to be able to then prepare them for the workplace and actually for the world on graduating because we know that hardly anyone stays in the same job that they graduate into these days. And so students need to have a set of generic skills that make them quite adaptable, quite flexible, uh, to be able to, I guess, have that resilience to be able to take on those challenges. 
Um, Evangelos raised his hand. Did you want to say something? Evangelo? Okay. So as we said, we know now that our modern workforce demands flexibility and that adaptability, but I'd also like to put in that resilience as well, because there are a lot of challenges on the global scale that all workplaces need to grapple with. And universities in the past have been very much focused on discipline knowledge and research in that discipline. And in a sense has sometimes ignored the really important skills of communication and, and team and teamwork. So um, we'd like to basically show you an example of how we've embedded authentic experiences in university programs here in Adelaide and how we've linked learning to the future workplace, the future where the graduates will be working in. And as part of that, we um, hope that we've also role modelled uh, the uh, meaning of civility to students. So they develop that understanding and appreciation that we are a collective whole, that we need to treat people with respect and also uh, by empowering others, we also empower ourselves. So work readiness, I guess, in a sense, um, is a concept that can be used as a metric to evaluate the effectiveness and the outcomes of our programs of study. John Mueller is one, another favorite um, educational author of mine, and he's done a lot of research in authentic learning and authentic assessment. And I believe that's sort of crucial to that work readiness. And basically, he's, he says that, you know, authentic learning and assessment enables students to develop skills beyond the mere acquisition of discipline knowledge as they perform real-world tasks that demonstrate a meaningful application of essential knowledge and skills. And I guess this is where uh, Evangelos mentioned about the problem-based learning and how important it is to actually embed that in uh, our... Uh, programs, it's, it's particularly if we can look at the relevant problems that the world's actually facing and then use them to base whatever discipline that we're in to um, address those issues. So um, it is a workshop, so we're going to get you to think a little bit now. And what we would like you to do is um, take a little bit of time and use the chat, if you like, to Give us um, a little bit about your background discipline. So let us know what discipline you teach in. And then on a score of about zero to five, think about how well you think your program or yourself um, incorporates authentic assessment in your teaching. So if you don't think you do it really well, then you can place a zero if you think you've got an excellent way of embedding problem-based learning or work readiness. Put a five and then everything else in between. And then we'll have a little chat about that. So is everyone happy to use the chat to do that? Okay. And they're coming out. Oh, Jurgen, thank you. Business and management. Arthur, four out of five. Awesome. Love to hear what you do in a moment. Jurgen, have you given yourself two out of five? Is that what that two stands for? For Dini, teacher education and applied linguistics. So you've given yourself a five, wonderful. Michael is a professor of strategic management and leadership, and you've rated a four. We were really looking forward to hearing, actually, how um, everyone else embeds authentic learning in their courses. Anybody else? Beautiful. Margarita, intercultural communication, four out of five. Fantastic. Evangelo, I haven't heard from you yet. Sorry, I just sent it to just one person. <laughs> oh, did you? Not a problem. Yeah, uh, just make sure that everyone is selected in the chat. 
I might ask my uh, colleagues, Kathy and Tanya, to maybe rate, rate themselves as well. So Arthur facilitates executive education in business and it's project-based and co -sealized. I don't even think I've heard of that word before, Arthur. Elpida, teaching Greek language, translation and linguistics, four out of five. Oral health, five out of five. Go, Kathy. Sorry, Sophie, it's a typo. It's socialised. Oh, socialised. I'm not going to think. Oh, I've never heard of that word. Wonderful. Okay, so that's actually quite uh, work ready, especially if it's project based. So I'd love to hear more about that later. Chen, history of education, four out of five. And Tanya's got Anna and Path, four out of five. So really, we're in a team of people. Um, Evangelist, five, your sociology and anthropology. Wonderful. So we're really in a team of lots of colleagues who, you know, are already embedding a lot of this authentic learning and assessment. So in the second part of the workshop, we'll have some breakout rooms where we can all share our experiences. So thank you for that. So moving on. Okay, so we decided, um, why did we need a framework to be able to um, to, to use. So we thought we really like to use evidence in everything that we do, especially without designing of learning and teaching. So we found this framework and then we adapted it a little bit and that helped us then design and in a sense benchmark what we did against. And so it helped us then implement our approach and then it also provided another framework where we could evaluate its effectiveness. So I'm just going to move on to the next uh, framework. And I don't know my, if my colleagues are wearing their T-shirt, but we even made T-shirts to go with our framework when we first presented this. So um, first of all, I'll just have to move everybody out a little bit. I can't even see my own framework. Do you believe that? Just one minute. Beautiful. Let's move everyone out the way. So, first of all, we thought the first bit is in the middle of that authentic assessment where we bridge the transition between learning and work. We need to, first of all, present a learning environment that challenges our students, challenges our learners to produce meaning or knowledge, and so that actually has deep relevance to them. We then um, realise that we need them to have some type of authentic assessment where they can then demonstrate their performance in the sense where we can also evaluate their uh, skills and knowledge. We then believed that they need to be able to transfer that knowledge in a way where they're linking what they're learning to their workplace, uh, to real world applications, and to their graduate employability. And crucial and that underpins all of that ability is for them to be able to develop the skill of metacognition so that they reflect on their learning about how to learn so that they then become critical thinkers and reflective learners that will go across their lifespan. We then thought it's really important to also have our clients or our stakeholders view and in some of our courses, you know, a lot of our students go out to field placements, to uh, if it's in health environment, they're going to clinical placements. So there they're working with graduates, they're, they're working with their clients, they're offering their services, and they're actually being able to pick up on those sort of authentic learning environments. So the course then can have a measurement of how well they the students are learning and how how the stakeholders can even do an assessment of their ability so leading on to that then is the fidelity of an assess on an authentic assessment you know so the assessment that we are designing is it replicating the workplace so are the methods that we're using replicating a workplace and we've always said to ourselves that nobody in the workplace sits by themselves supervise writing a three hour exam or writing for three hours. So we really, it really challenged us to rethink our assessment approaches. And then of course, embedded in all of this 
beautiful framework is the fact that we embed these feedback cycles so that we give feedback, we receive feedback, students are providing each other with feedback and students are also providing feedback to their um, teachers, but also teachers um, also delivering feedback to the learners. So it's multifaceted. And of course, key to all of this then, because they're working in these real life environments, they're building those communication skills, then they're building their teamwork skills and those collaborative learning skills. And that all then is basically the uh, summary of our framework. And what I'll do now is I'm going to hand you over to my colleagues who will then show you examples of how um, this framework is embedded in their courses. So I'll stop sharing and I'll ask Cathy if you could share and cover your portion. Of course. Uh, good evening, everyone here in Adelaide. Of course, uh, over in uh, your part of the world, it's, it's the morning. So it's wonderful to have this medium to be able to uh, communicate, share practice, and to sort of feel as though we're together. It's not as good as us being there. We did have great plans last year, but as you know, uh, everybody had great plans last year. I'm just going to have to... Um, uh, get my, um, I, I do apologise for this, just get my um, present, uh, my part of the PowerPoint up and I'll just get back to that in just a moment um, to share it with you. Um, just come down there. Here we are. Whoops. Now I've got to share that. Sorry, everyone. Share screen. I don't know what's going on, everyone. I'll just have to. It's okay. I thought we were using the same PowerPoint. That's my fault. And I didn't have mine open, but I do now. And I will, um, I will share it right now. Um. I'm pretty sure now people should be able to see that. No. Yes, we can. Okay, lovely. So as Sophie has uh, already uh, given you the uh, introduction to the fact that this is very much a team effort, and um, I think the value of any sort of um, educational initiative uh, like this, a framework, it, it's great that it can be used in more than one discipline. Um, you know, sometimes there's very bespoke reasons why you might develop it just for a science um, course. But I think when you've got a discipline, um, uh, cross-disciplinary uh, um, application for it, it really shows the great, um, I suppose, uh, flexibility of any framework. So we're going to show you a couple of cross-disciplinary exemplars from the University of Adelaide. Uh, in the team that we uh, developed this with, uh, other team members were from other faculties such as science and uh, business, uh, computer science. Mine is in the area of oral health practice, which is part of the dental school. So this was a level two second year course in the Bachelor of Oral Health. And it um, was actually exciting because it was in the area of simulation. So simulation is a very big part of education in most of the um, health science areas. So you want to have, um, you know, uh, clinicians that are working on you, first of all, learning the uh, psychomotor aspects of the work, um, usually on things like skulls or mannequins, uh, so that the public safety is protected. But even in, within that area of training, it's great to be able to implement authentic assessment in that context, because often what happened was people were trained initially in um, a lot of the health science areas, probably many others as well. And the assessment was very much kind of lockstep, not really related to the real world. So people would do very well. They would pass. They get out into the real world and they didn't really feel connected to it. So what a lot of uh, health science training does these days is it starts that authentic assessment right from the beginning. 
So students are immersed in the discipline, they're assessed in the discipline, everything relates to their future practice. And I've often said to my students, if I can't uh, give you a reason why we're doing this, we're learning this, we're assessing you on this, then maybe it shouldn't be in the course because everything should relate to getting them work ready. So Sophie and myself have been involved in this area of, um, of education and training for many years, and we've seen great changes. And I think that uh, the practitioners that are graduating these days have a far better understanding of their place and their context because they're taught in context and they're assessed in context. Can people hear my husband in the background? I'm going to shut the door. Hang on for a moment. You men don't shut doors after you. Sorry about that. <laughs> so um, I think this um, statement at the top really says it all, doesn't it? That beyond that traditional psychomotor component of in our area, how to hold a drill, how to use instruments, um, you've got to actually combine the cognitive and effective aspects to genuinely prepare students for future practice. And that's what we've really striven to do in the last um, 20 or so years as we've um, continually refined, continually reflected, got feedback, asked graduates, asked employers about how clinical simulation for oral health practice can embed authentic assessment. So what I'm doing in this um, short exemplar is I'm going to see uh, the, uh, you're going to see the oval up the top with the different components of the framework that Sophie has already introduced. And we're gonna look at each aspect of the assessment in the uh, simulation clinic. So the great thing about this framework is, as has already been mentioned, is it can develop an assessment approach, but it can also evaluate and help to modify an existing one. And that's what we like about it because as we have many um, well-established authentic assessment approaches, it's always good to continually reflect on how we might do it better. And you can see in um, oral health practice, simulation has been enhanced continuously, particularly in the area of developing technology. And those two images on that right-hand side show the kind of technology now that students have at their simulation. And this is where, you know, when my training, we used to use skulls. It was very unrealistic. Now we have a, a, a simulated surgery. And this is where people in this area of learning and assessment actually feel like they're that graduate doing the job. So the first part about how the assessment activity challenges the student when I applied this framework to my approach, I saw that um, we use a very scaffold um, approach to assessment where we commence with basic concepts and across the semester, we progress to more um, complex ones. So the activities challenge the student for the particular area of the course that they're in. Um, and so what we want to do is eventually they get assessed on all aspects of oral health care, but it's very unfair to expect a novice to be fully proficient in all areas at the start. So using a scaffolded approach always helps to challenge the student, but does it in a way where they're not overwhelmed. So that challenging area needs to be considered that it's challenging, but not overwhelming. So that's how we felt we'd addressed that part of the framework. In terms of the product or the performance that was required, what we actually did was we actually developed a, a treatment phase of a six week period. And you can see on that right hand side, the students actually using a, a mannequin, the head's not quite in view. So it's just like they're sitting in a dental clinic. It's just like they're treating a patient. And instead of having sessions or uh, tutorials, over the six week period, we actually called each session an appointment. So it made it very much like you'd be working in practice. 
and we felt that the appointment was um, a good thing to start embedding in the student's psyche because that's how, as a graduate, they're going to work. And then what we found was by making this part of the um, assessment around about 60%, we then derived other aspects of the assessment from other areas, but we made this the focus. So the main part of their assessment spread over this six week period was done just in the way that they would be working as a graduate, but also we made sure that we assess them at the level of the um, uh, part of the course they were in. So part two of the framework, as I said, we applied it to what we were doing and we felt we were able to demonstrate how we'd done that. The idea about knowledge transfer is something that, you know, um, we sometimes grapple with because, you know, sometimes students have great knowledge but they often find it very difficult to translate that to actually demonstrating it in a skill. And so what we used to do uh, quite regularly was produce um, rather homespun, but very authentic um, videos. Often the students were involved in it. You can see there on the uh, left-hand side, there is a, a mannequin head with teeth. It's even got a tongue and cheeks. And students would often be involved in perhaps, for example, uh, filming their own technique. And then they may in fact self-assess or peer assess how they were holding the instruments, how effective the procedure was. They may be required to uh, summarize um, what they were doing. And so that idea of being able to uh, look at the skill being demonstrated and actually uh, demonstrate that they understand the things that are important we found was a very rich part of our authentic assessment approach. And there's some of our wonderful oral health students looking very demure there, um, discussing uh, performance. And I think this also at this early stage of their learning helps to introduce the authentic aspect of peer review because um, our graduates, like many health uh, graduates, work in teams and the importance of feeling comfortable to provide review and feedback to a peer as well as to receive it is very important. And it's very important in this part of the course that it's uh, authentically uh, embedded in it. Hello everyone. Oops. Um, so today we're doing some prophylaxis. So this and is one of the students who's describing what he's doing. And deliberately. So and they're working from distal to medial. So I this also made one of these to put in my clinic folder just to always go back to to follow. And it has the five A's there, which we'll learn about very soon. So that's just those videos that the students are demonstrating their understanding of the skill by performing it or, dem or uh, describing it. So we found that a really, the students loved it and it was a very, even though a very important part of their assessment, they didn't feel it was a very threatening part. And assessment traditionally always seems very threatening. I think what we've been able to do in this approach is make it feel natural, that we're continually assessing ourselves, our peers, our work. Then that metacognitive aspect where we're going to actually link uh, concepts so it's not just one area of practice. So the assessment rubric that we developed to accompany this um, piece of um, uh, learning and assessment included things like underpinning knowledge, the rationale. So not just being able to recite why something should be done, but why it's important or why they decided it. We also brought in things like ergonomics, infection control, hand skills, all things that are part of graduate practice and continue to be. And then even things like professional behaviour. You weren't allowed to lean on your mannequin's head. Also time management, something that because we use this appointment approach, the students were being assessed on how well they were able to complete the task in the appointment time, which is always ongoing in our graduate practice. So everything was always based on what do they need to have for graduate practice to be successful and to be work ready when they graduate? So I guess that we were also keen to make sure that the assessment had the performance 
or the product that could be recognised by a client or a stakeholder. For example, in this case, it might be a, uh, an employer. So we actually got the students to develop an appointment book on their computers, just like they would use in graduate practice. So they began very early in their, um, in their education experience to think like a graduate. Of course, we didn't have the expectations of having as many patients, but they got used to having an appointment book, things that often were tacked on right at the end or even were never included in assessment at university or any other training institution. And people often struggled with that when they first started working. So by putting it into the uh, assessment performance right from uh, very early on in the course, it became second nature to them very early on. Uh, fidelity, uh, how real it felt, um, how um, it relates to how you should be thinking even as a student. So I remember when I was a student, and that's quite a few years ago in this same discipline, we sort of had just tasks to do. It might have been a filling or it might have been some sort of a cleaning procedure and they were just on their own. Now, in this approach, they are still done, but they're done with the patient or the, the dummy actually having a name, a date of birth, all the things that a patient would have so that instead of calling it the dummy or the mannequin or the tooth, people were encouraged and assessed on their ability to actually relate to that as a real patient. And so this is where I think, once again, I've even heard graduates talk about, you know, I've got a filling coming in for my next appointment, not I've got Mrs. Um, you know, Smith coming in for my next appointment for a clean. It was I've got a clean coming in. So they weren't given that opportunity to develop those um, interpersonal um, skills right from the start. And in fact, the assessment of this included things like the uh, ability to develop uh, a good case note, things that really are valuable in future practice. So I'm a real boy, <laughs> not just a dummy. So getting on to the last few um, uh, parts of the um, framework, um, you know, the discussion and the feedback is just so important. Asking the student how they're going, how they feel they're performing, telling them your observations and asking them again, how might you improve in the future? What's the next step in, in, that you see in your um, development? This once again simulates a very um, uh, important part of graduate practice. When people begin their careers in dentistry and oral health, as in many other forms of health science, they have a mentor often or a senior person who is giving them that guidance. We start that very much in the undergraduate years. And lastly, um, does that assessment activity that we feel is authentic is um, requiring the students to collaborate. And we are always putting the students into what we call practices or groups. They confer, they formulate treatment plans together. And this is where we feel it's simulating once again that graduate practice in their um, uh, assessment tasks as a student. So we felt very uh, comfortably that it was authentic assessment. So I'm going to now stop my share and I'm going to uh, hand over to our second exemplar uh, from uh, Dr. Tanya Crotty from our um, Adelaide University School of Nursing. I'll get her to unmute yourself. And Tanya, you're going to share your screen now. Tanya, we, you unmute, yeah. Beautiful. Yep, done that. Oh, good. We'll be just I'll just... Five minutes now. Yeah. Yes, no, that's okay because um, much of what uh, Kathy's gone through can allow me to sort of segue into mine as I'll, I'll just do it as a more brief uh, example of just a different type of course. So uh, I coordinate, I actually um, teach into nursing and coordinate nursing, a biology for nursing practice course, but I also uh, coordinate um, investigative cell biology, which is a third year course. And that's what I'll be uh, focusing on here. So this course 
essentially came from um, a course I did uh, myself way back in the day that was um, focused around topics and techniques in research, but it was actually a quite a dry course. Um, when I returned to the university, it had changed to basic cell biology course. But what we've done now is develop it more as an integration between the cell biology and the background pathology and linking it to the methods and the research that can be used in research practice to look at that biology and pathology. So it's been designed so that it's more of a segue for, for students to either go into research or go on and do specialised research um, in a particular project for honours or even into higher degree by research, because we felt that they didn't really have a course that transitioned them to this, to be able to integrate not only their background biology and pathology knowledge, but to understand what practices they can use and the methods they can use to explore those further. So in this course, we actually have affiliates teaching from across the university in the Faculty of Health and Med Medical Sciences. And what this does is it gives our affiliates the opportunity to interact with undergraduate students, which they struggle to get actual contact with. So these are affiliates or researchers that are in our hospitals and that are in our, our um, you know, isolated laboratories in, in research institutes. And so it enables them to have that contact with our students, but our students now are exposed to not only these active researchers that are internationally and nationally known, but that are also, um, uh, it also enables, so the students to break down the barriers essentially for potential supervisors, to have an understanding of research going on across South Australia and identify perhaps areas that they might want to then um, reach out to these people for research placements uh, or even um, career opportunities. So it's to help them segue and transition to that higher degree or, um, or, even, a, or even a career position. So the students get to interact with these potential employers or higher degree supervisors. So in addressing um, the framework that has been explained to you by uh, Sophie and, and Kathy, what we, how do we now bring in assessment that challenges our students? So what we do in our course is really to get them to understand, not actually carry out the techniques and methods because we have research placements as a central core subject in the course, but to be able to understand the um, reading about research material and understanding what the techniques do and what their limitations are, because that's something that I found myself. I didn't learn until I was actually in the research myself. So if they go into a lab, they can actually start to think, well, okay, they're using ELISAs or they're using a particular technique, but, but why? What are the applications? What are the limitations? And what else could a lab be using as well? So they're required to start to identify limitations of the studies that they read about. And they're challenged to also do this in more of a team environment. So we have workshops where they, they talk. And again, as Kathy and Sophie mentioned, they're encouraged to, to talk about things um, fairly and respectfully their group members when we carry out workshops talking about the application and limitation of techniques. So in terms of a product, they actually are asked to then over the course of the semester, work in a group as we would in writing a manuscript or as we would in writing a, a grant in our particular fields and generate what we refer to as a critical research proposal. So we don't want to overwhelm them, as Cathy uh, said, a lot of them haven't quite got to this point of training yet, but they've got to start to read about methods and start to think, okay, what's a gap in this area? What's, um, what's a contention in the field? And how might I go about addressing that? And they do that in a group so that they can sort of use their knowledge, they're each learning from different research placements, 
but put that together uh, in a proposal to plan what to do next. And I, I suppose I, I try and explain to them that it's analogous to almost a business plan, that by writing a grant, you're fighting for money, you're fighting, um, you know, you're comparing yourself to other uh, fields and studies, and you're almost writing a business plan to sell why what you want to do is important and what techniques and methods you've chosen, why they're relevant and, and appropriate. So it does in, involve, um, so it involves them integrating and, and transferring knowledge that we talk about in these workshops, but also understanding by having these affiliates talk to them about their research, they know about the pathology and the current area of research, but the, these affiliates are also teaching them about the techniques and the models being used in their labs and what limitations that they find with using those techniques in the labs. So the students are hearing about current research, current models and techniques, and they can start to use that knowledge in writing their own proposals. So they've got to think about design and analysis as you would in, in designing your own proposal. And then their assessment in terms of map metacognition, what we do is get them early on to do a draft. And we refer to this as a dot point plan. And this essentially allows us and their group members to provide feedback early on so that we can understand, I suppose, their baseline of understanding how they're interpreting their topic and give them feedback early on so that they haven't gone too far down in writing a proposal um, and they've gone down rabbit holes. So we try to do this by getting them to do a draft early on and sharing ideas with us and sharing ideas with their group. What we've also done is provide a de-identified example so that they sort of have something that they can align what they're doing now uh, and the techniques in the field they're talking about to something that we've got as perhaps exemplars of um, that previous students have provided. So in terms of them being authentic by a client or a stakeholder, because we have um, these affiliates or these re researchers talk about um, an area that is within, um, that's their area of expertise, it's fields of research across the faculty that are currently going on, those um, affiliates also provide us with a topic. So the students can pick from a topic that's provided by these affiliates and those affiliates can also give them feedback along the way on their draft. And they also are the people that then assess those um, final research proposals. So this is as if they would be assessed by a reviewer in the field, which is what they now have to start getting used to as they start moving forward in research. Of course, they have to get used to getting that feedback from reviewers of their manuscripts or reviewers of their grants. Sorry, Tanya, we've got about yes. one minute. Yeah. Oh, yep, yeah, no problem. So in the fidelity required for the assessment in the environment and the assessment tools is that essentially we write these manuscripts and we write these grants in, um, in groups and we get that feedback. So again, it's them learning to um, be receptive to feedback and then perhaps feed forward and work on that feedback from their uh, initially in their dot plan and then in writing the, the grant and getting feedback again from that. So this involves an ongoing process of discussion and feedback from their peers, um, from us reviewing um, their work. And we do that through using an online platform um, using uh, called Turnitin. And then um, that ongoing task and the DOT plan is a collaborative effort between those different students. So I'll just finish there in the interest of time. So Sophie, do we have time to move on with the, um, the framework or we've... I'll hand it over to Margarita. Uh, thank you so much. It was a great presentation, uh, Kathy, Tanya and Sophie. Uh, unfortunately, we have to respect time, especially since we are yes. remote. And uh, we have a comment from uh, uh, our dear Michael. Love this topic. To any business professors out there, in my capstone strategic management courses, we use comprehensive case study analysis and students are also grouped. 
and charged with running a virtual company. The company produces action cameras and drones. They complete head to head with the class teams and are ranked globally with students around the world. So uh, thank you, Michael, for sharing. And thank you. Yes, thank Very you. Very interesting indeed. And um, uh, Tanya, you can stop sharing now. And yes, I'm just, uh, oh, there we go, sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. And I will ask uh, Professor Chen Wang before we go to a, a, a little break, uh, who was confused with the Greek uh, summertime, uh, Chen Wang, Vice Dean of Beijing University of China, uh, to say uh, two words. Hi, everyone. Dear President Margarita, uh, dear Ambassador of uh, Communication Institute of Greece, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and dear friends, uh, it's my great pleasure to join you in the second international conference in education online today. On um, behalf of uh, Beijing Normal University, please allow me to express warm congratulations on the opening of the conference. Thank you to the active public city and the constant efforts to communication institutes of Greece. This academic festival has received extensive attention and active participation from scholars at home and abroad. Uh, we should advance that education is a valuable resource we have. On the other hand, it is also a resource which is all too scarce for millions of people around the world. Education is a key to all the sustainable development goals 2020 is an uh, unforgettable year for each of us. The global education system is undergoing unprecedented challenges in the global fight against COVID-19. Pandemic, schools, colleges, and universities are closed to curb the spread of the COVID-19. The level of transformation to distance learning has brought into sharp focus on education quality through improvement in the digital time. This online conference will lead us to think deeply on our role and responsibility to education educators in promoting world peace and development. The cooperation among participants demonstrates a good example of the spirit of cooperation and communication. Finally, I'd like to wish all of you healthy and wish this international conference will be successful. Thank you. Thank you, dear Chen, and I have to say uh, we met with uh, Dear Chen uh, three or four years ago, and I was impressed by his uh, openness because we know Chinese culture, and I have discussed a little bit with Chen, is, uh, is difficult to, to, to be open, communicative, and congratulations to, to Chen, who also uh, helps his students and his university to, to be open and to communicate and to participate in international events. This is a, a, a big opportunity for them. Uh, so we will have a, almost three minutes uh, little break before we go on with the next session. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.
So hello again. I believe that we can start the our roundtable session uh, with uh, the roundtable uh, facilitator, leader, Dr. Georgian Rudolph, head of research, senior lecturer and academic partner liaison, Kaplan, Singapore, editor in chief, journal of applied learning and teaching. Singapore and also our dear uh, honorary vice president. Uh, Jordan, you have so many titles that we cannot write them down. Well, thank you so much, uh, Margarita. You're too kind as always. So uh, it's, my, it's my great pleasure to uh, facilitate uh, this uh, roundtable discussion. And uh, in, in case you're wondering who is part of the roundtable, uh, all of you are, <laughs> so so please um, uh, do feel uh, very free uh, to ask uh, questions um, and so on. So the the title of this uh, roundtable is ameliorating education. So it's it's all about uh, improving education, in other words. And uh, we have uh, two very interesting uh, topics by uh, presenters from China. Uh, the first one is uh, Ma Dong Ying, uh, who is a PhD student at the uh, Comparative Education Institute of um, International. Uh, sorry, um, of International and Comparative Education uh, at uh, Beijing Normal University, China, and uh, her topic is uh, world-class universities proactive actions and logical implications for fighting COVID-19, a case study of Nanyang Technological University. So that's a university that I'm quite familiar with, uh, which is in Singapore, uh, just in case you, you wanted to know. <laughs> and uh, the, the second uh, participant is uh, Zhou Shuchen, um, a graduate student um, also from uh, the uh, Faculty of Education at Beijing Normal University, China. And his topic is what motivates undergraduates to learn and be recommended for graduate study, uh, a case study based on a professional university in China. So, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, in my interpretation, uh, the Beijing Normal University is a teacher's college. Uh, so it's basically a teacher training uh, institution and, uh, and of course, it is uh, higher education. So what I would like to suggest is um, uh, that we give uh, both presenters uh, five minutes, um, you know, for uh, uh, five minutes each, right? <laughs> so don't worry, it's not going to be uh, that short. Um, uh, to, to briefly uh, introduce uh, their uh, two super interesting topics. And uh, then we have a golden opportunity to ask some questions to, to both presenters. And uh, as I already said, all of you are extremely welcome to ask uh, questions, of course. And, um, you know, once we have discussed uh, the, the two uh, presentations, uh, then we can actually also, if you, if you like to, uh, go uh, beyond uh, the, the topics a little bit and uh, ask them some general questions. Uh, for instance, since, since one of the topics is uh, COVID, you know, that I think we are all uh, still uh, very much concerned about, uh, we could ask uh, how is the situation now uh, regarding higher education and the pandemic uh, in both uh, China and uh, in Singapore. Uh, so I think the first presentation uh, will be by uh, Ma Dong Ying. So please take it away. Okay, thanks, Jordan. Uh, hello, all of professors. Uh, my name is Ma Dongying from Beijing Normal University. Uh, now I will share screen. Wait a moment. Mm. Wait, wait. Okay. 
Can you look at the PPT? We can see. Okay. Um, hello, all of us. Uh, no, no, we, we, can, we cannot see the, the PowerPoint. Sorry, we, we can only see uh, your, your files. You must have the file, dear. Uh... We, we can only see a, a picture of, of all your files, you know, like abstract publishing agreement and so on. We cannot see the PowerPoint. You can't see the PowerPoint. No. You should first uh, open the PowerPoint on your screen and then try to share it. I tried. Okay. If not, send it to me in the chat and I will do it. Uh, yeah, you. you can also present without the PowerPoint. That wouldn't be a problem. Don't worry. Okay. What? I will not use the PowerPoint. My computer has done something wrong. Okay. No problem. Sorry. I'm sorry. No Okay, um, the title is World Class Universities, Proactive Actions and the Logical Implications for Fighting COVID-19, a case study of Nyan Technological University. Uh, the paper is divided into four, in, uh, four sections. The first section is the uh, introduction, as a brief introduction. Uh, I think the capacity of preventing and controlling the COVID-19 epidemic- You, you can stop, that. sorry to interrupt, you can stop sharing so that we can see you in full screen. Just stop sharing. Okay. I just share my screen. Is it not clear? Um, can I just uh, share my screen? Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, Shooting, you can. Okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> now it's okay. Okay. It's okay. No, you can you can talk. Please don't don't uh, don't care about the. It's okay. Okay. The title is the world class universities proactive actions and the logical implications for fighting COVID nineteen, a case study of Nyan Technological University. Uh, the paper is divided into four sections. Uh, the first section is the brief introduction. I think the ability of preventing and controlling the COVID-19 epidemic is regarded as the significant mark of science to examine whether the world-class universities will be able to continue the first-class standards in various fields, okay, and the abnormal situation. Therefore, the conception of first class requires that universities should not only exert the influence and the radiation and the traditional normalization, but also be able to defend their mission, uh, shoulder the social responsibility actively, take the national strategy as the guidance, uh, meet the needs of society and nation positively. Uh, and make the unique contribution to the peace and the tranquility of the nation while facing the uh, health and the safety incidents. Uh, as what the president, uh, Sabras the Raj, the pre uh, current president of Singapore's uh, Nyan Technological University said, the COVID-19 epidemic underlines the university's contribution uh, and uh, to the government and society, and it has to adapt the new challenges, such as Nyan Technological University, which could participate actively in epidemic prevention and control, lead to innovating knowledge and benefiting the society. Uh, the next section, next section, uh, I want to introduce the actions taken by NTU for fighting for the COVID-19. Uh, it has three uh, three actions, I think. The first one is strengthening, uh, strengthening the scientific and technological innovation, uh, I think is uh, sharing their wisdom wealth. Based on the scientific research, 
uh, NTU contributes to the theoretical guidance and the technical, uh, technical support for preventing the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the second, I think, is guidance management, and the, uh, it has uh, constructed the service network uh, implementing the student-oriented educational idea and providing practical guarantee for students' study and life. Uh, the, sec uh, the third section, I think is it has um, promoted cooperation uh, to uh, school between school and enterprise, making them work together to, uh, to rejuvenate, re rejuvenate the national economy. The next, uh, next page. I think uh, it's, uh, I will analyze the NTU's logical implications in response to the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, the first one, I think the president, uh, president's leadership is used as the precondition and the epidemic action. Uh, the second, I think advanced scientific and the technological innovation is used as the support mechanism in anti-epidemic action. Uh, the last one, uh, I think the abundant uh, fund reserve is used as the material guarantee for anti-epidemic action. Okay, the last one uh, is a brief conclusion. Uh, as a well-known world-class university, Nanyang Technological University has advanced the education ideas, uh, unique internal organization and governance structure sufficient funding and the president is keen inside a deep sense of social responsibility. Uh, the positive interaction between the president's leadership and the above elements enables NTU to continuously improve its internal quality and the background of normalization. Uh, we got innovation uh, at this mission height take advantage of knowledge and technology and the abnormal challenges and take responsibility as the driving force for development, which is the trend for world-class university. Okay, thank you. Okay, brilliant. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, now let's let's hear for approximately five minutes from uh, Tso Shu Chen. And apologies that I got your gender wrong earlier. <laughs> I will maybe five minutes plus to share my presentation. Uh, and uh, I'm, from, uh, I'm also from Beijing Normal University, and I'm now the graduate student. Uh, my name is Zhu Chenzhou. Uh, and we can hardly listen to you, dear uh, uh, Zhu. Can you approach the microphone or yeah, speak, speak, speak uh, closer into the mic if possible? Okay, no problem. Can you hear me now? Uh, slightly better, but if you can even speak more closely into the microphone, that would be better. So maybe there's a equipment restriction. Can you hear me now? Right now? Uh, it's okay. At the moment, we can't hear you though. Uh, maybe you're frozen. Um, yeah, un unfortunately, I think uh, the, the connection of uh, Xu Chen uh, seems to have frozen. Um, I, I must say I was quite positively surprised um, how well this was working just now with, with Dong Ying, uh, because I, I've been working uh, the whole term uh, with some uh, participants from China and always a lot of connectivity problems, unfortunately. Um, so. Uh, it seems like we have lost uh, Shu Chen uh, for a moment. Oh, no, she. I, I, I can still see her. Okay, so so can you can you please try again? Sorry for that. Um, no problem. Okay. Yeah, and 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 try to speak into the mic as as loud as you can, please. Problem. Thank you. And you can even switch off your camera. And this is how the connection uh, can be better so that we can listen to what you say. Mm. 
Uh, unfortunately, we, we can't hear you, uh, Shu Chen, in case you can hear us. Um, but but I think that was a good idea by Margarita to, to switch off the camera because that may take less bandwidth, actually. Uh, but we, we still cannot hear you regrettably. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't have the, the text of the uh, presentation. Uh, but of course, we have the the abstract book. Uh, would would that help uh, if I if I just use the abstract book to? Yes, you can a little bit. Uh, All right. Make a small presentation. Yeah. For her, I'm, I'm so sorry. I just need to. Find, yes. I just need to. Great. I just need to find it. Just give me a moment. Yes, of course, of course. Um, yeah. We have all experienced by the, the remote and uh, maybe some yeah. activities uh, difficult to achieve. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a very, very uh, interesting abstract. Uh, so I've, I've found now. it now and now. Uh, maybe, maybe I can uh, also share it on my screen. Um, Yep. Um, so uh, let me just give you the gist of it. So it's it's a very interesting uh, piece. Uh, so she is saying, uh, in the field of higher education, China's post-credit recommendation policy as a talent training policy parallel to the national post-credit qualification exam has brought more diverse development opportunities for students, but there are also certain problems. Um, and then this is actually one of the things that I also want to ask her about. <laughs> uh, she is writing, uh, there's a mismatch uh, between education policy and education practice, right? Which sounds very intriguing. Uh, and then she's saying, on the other hand, a postgraduate recommendation policy has deviated from the original value of the original uh, intention. Uh, and then she continues, the market oriented evaluation of education under neoliberalism has changed uh, the role of outstanding students while the educational context has produced a restrictive order that reinforces students' learning behaviors. So that, that really, uh, I also found uh, extremely intriguing uh, because um, we, we all know uh, China um, uh, has still a, a communist system. So I was very uh, intrigued uh, uh, and there was this reference Neoliberalism. neoliberalism. Yeah. And uh, I think this is also something that, um, if, if it's possible, <laughs> um, uh, technically, uh, I would like to uh, discuss a little bit uh, later. And uh, as you can see, she has done some qualitative research uh, by interviewing uh, 12 uh, undergraduate students uh, using a grounded theory. So that also sounds uh, extremely interesting. And, uh, and she was, uh, she was uh, at the motivation uh, in this uh, qualitative uh, study. And um, I think uh, what she what she found is that, um, to, to use my own words, uh, there was a lot of uh, metrification. So uh, metrics are playing a very important role. Uh, you can see uh, rankings, uh, grades, uh, number of papers published. And uh, that is uh, the, the kind of uh, free market uh, competition uh, that uh, the, the neoliberal approach uh, obviously favors. So I, I thought this was extremely interesting uh, that we can also find uh, such practices in China, which I, which I previously did not know, uh, because I would have expected them more uh, in Western countries like the US, the UK and Australia, uh, for instance. So, so I hope this uh, helps a little bit. It is obviously no no replacement, oh, no replacement. for uh, Xu Chen's um, uh, presentation, but but I hope that uh, helps a little bit. So, uh, uh, can I, Professor, can you hear me? How is, how is, uh, yes, can can hear you. Okay, <laughs> I'm really sorry for the problem, and then change no, my. No 
to enter re-enter the zoom yeah okay good now, now we can hear you loud and clear that's that's wonderful um so so is, is that okay if we if we go to the question part or would you like to add anything to what i just said okay no problem that's great okay great um uh, very good uh, so so maybe uh, we can start uh, with uh, dong ing's uh, presentation uh, so as I highlighted earlier, this is actually about Singapore, uh, a mm -hmm. country where I've been living for, for more than half of my life. Uh, so I guess that's that's also one of the reasons why I have the honor of uh, facilitating uh, this session. And um, when when I was listening to, to Dong Ying, uh, I think she was saying that there were a couple of reasons why uh, Nanyang Technological University did well uh, during yeah. the pandemic. Uh, and that was the, the leadership, right? By she, she especially highlighted uh, the president and uh, being very student-centric uh, and also some uh, technological uh, innovations. Um, so my, my first question is, uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, how you conducted your research? Uh, in particular, what kind of research methods you were using? Uh, okay. Uh... I think based on the advanced scientific research level, uh, NTU has provided the theoretical guidance and the scientific payoff to contribute to the uh, perfecting the COVID-19. Uh, firstly, uh, I want to take some examples. Okay, uh, firstly, uh, for preventing the spread of various NTU's experts and the scholars from different disciplines, uh, made the joint efforts to carry out interdisciplinary research, explore the transmission, uh, me transmission mechanism of virus. Secondly, uh, the experts and scholars have established a, a famous um, mathematical model to observe and explore the speed of virus um, was more as the last. Uh, I think to improve the direction, uh, detection, uh, detection uh, methods and the Lifting the detecting speed, experts from NTU uh, invented the direct PCR technology, which can shorten the detection time to 36 minutes. Okay. All right. Excellent. Um, I'm I'm sorry. Maybe I can uh, just just ask again. Uh, my my question is actually: uh, Is your um, presentation based on a kind of conceptual uh, paper? You know where you're mm -hmm. just referring to to secondary sources like uh, websites and uh, newspaper articles, or or did you actually conduct some primary research? Um, you know where you were, for instance, interviewing people or conducting a survey, and, and uh, literature you, based you, again. Literature based research. Oh, literature, literature based. based. Excellent. That 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 essentially answers my question. And uh, yeah. can, can I also ask? Uh, how come you are interested in in Nanyang Technological University? Did you did you study there by any chance? Or? No, um, uh, yeah, uh, I have a, uh, I have a teacher in Nanyang Technological University. Uh, I always uh, learning with him online. All right, excellent. I'm interested, I'm interested in uh, the scientific research and the uh, talent cultivation in Nanyang Technological uh, University. Brilliant, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. And, and if I may ask uh, another question. Um, yeah. So, so Nanyang Technological University is um, one of the so-called autonomous uh, universities in, in Singapore. Okay. Uh, I mean, the, the oldest is the, the National University of Singapore. Uh, NTU is actually the, the second oldest. And uh, there, there are four others. And uh, they are basically, um, uh, I, I think we can call them state universities. Uh, I mean, they're, they're just called um, autonomous, autonomous universities. Autonomous. That's yeah. right, they're called autonomous <laughs> uh, in, in Singapore. And basically, my, my question is, uh, are they really so autonomous? Uh, because uh, that's actually not my uh, observation. And uh, especially during uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, I think the, the government in Singapore uh, gave uh, directives 
and uh, then basically everybody had to to follow <laughs> you know yeah. uh, and and it was it was it was not so autonomous i mean that's that's basically my point uh, would you would you agree with that uh, that we can actually say that uh, across uh, the board in in higher education um, mm. the, the responses to the pandemic were actually quite similar i think the president um, makes the uh, important role in uh, fighting the COVID-19. On, uh, okay. on the one hand, I think it stems from president ability and quality. Uh, you know, the Sabrash, uh, uh, yes. Sabrash, okay? Uh, on the other hand, it benefits from the uh, operation mechanism of administrative power. Yeah. Administrative yeah. power, I think, is very important. Absolutely, I, I think that's an that's an excellent uh, answer. And um, let let's talk a little bit about uh, the the role of the president. Uh, so 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 earlier, uh, we were uh, actually talking. I mean, if I if I understood uh, Fortini correctly, um, in an earlier session, uh, she was she was talking about distributed leadership, right? So that that actually there are many leaders, you know, not not just one leader <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. at the top. Um, yeah. But uh, I, when I was um, uh, reading up uh, this this morning uh, on the NTU president, I also was quite impressed <laughs> uh, because uh, Professor uh, Supra Suresh uh, is actually a man of many distinctions. So he's he's Indian uh, American, and uh, he was at uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was director of the National Science. Uh, Foundation in the U.S., the president of Carnegie Mellon uh, University <laughs> in the U.S., and so on, and 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 then uh, he uh, came to Singapore and took up that role. So, so definitely an extremely uh, impressive uh, CV. Um, so, so how would you uh, characterize uh, his leadership, and uh, what what other factors uh, do you think could influence his leadership, uh, both uh, positively and negatively? Uh, I think she, uh, he is not only a president in a technological university, but also a social leader. I think he's a social leader, <laughs> social leader. Uh, a surprise rush, uh, social responsibility is widely pressed. Uh, I think he saw that the development of, of the university should meet the need of the society. Now, uh, Singapore um, is facing the challenges of fighting uh, COVID-19. So the university uh, must uh, make some uh, research, uh, scientific research, uh, do some uh, scientific and uh, technological innovation uh, to uh, for fighting the, the COVID-19. What's more, mm -hmm. introduce administrative power uh, operation affects the performance of president's leadership, I think. Uh, since the university is autonomy, you said you said that uh, autonomy, the board gave the president high decision making power. The president in NTU and Sabrash uh, has the power to uh, allocate the resource and has the power to organize experts and the scholars in different dif uh, disciplines uh, to work together to do some uh, interdisciplinary research for fighting the COVID nineteen. Okay, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, I think we, uh, you know, I'm looking at the time and I think we should ask uh, also Shu Chen uh, some questions. Um, so when, when I was... Maybe, uh, I, I, maybe we can ask also the, the other participants if they, uh, if they want to ask something, the students as that's well. That's uh, I was I was observing the, the chat. The uh, chat. Um, so. Okay, I... Is, is there somebody raising the, the hand? Because I, I didn't see anything in the chat, that's why I was just continuing. <laughs> but we can leave the, the, the other student as well. Uh, Absolutely. And if you have any question, please uh, write in the chat so uh, we yeah. can ask the students, okay. That, that sounds good. Uh, let's, let's do that. Um, excellent. Um, okay, so um, earlier when I was uh, presenting uh, Shuchen's uh, abstract, I was already saying 
uh, that uh, she wrote about the mismatch between education policy and education practice in China. Uh, could you please uh, tell us a little bit more about that, uh, Xu Chen? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, since the keyword in our session is to improve the education, and uh, I like to uh, say that in China, the original intention of education policy uh, setting, uh, such as the recommendation and uh, uh, examination policy, is to allow more uh, outstanding students to enter the master study. And however, in the real practice process, um, it means some real problems. Uh, for example, in the enrollment, some schools have enrolled more than 15% um, of the recommended student rather than the uh, examination student. And uh, uh, maybe uh, do this student need to be trained differently or uh, is that uh, proportion is um, is, is good or is that uh, scientific? And um, because each university set its own measurement, uh, it is often sometimes a pre, a perceived uh, as not being fair enough. So such as student being uh, overly uh, uh, military driven. And in the process of interview uh, participants in my study, uh, I will I was also uh, got that many students um, are indeed motivated by uh, other external influences, such as a desire to get into the better school or social needs. Uh, rather than pursuing the true love of knowledge and a particular uh, major, and that's something that we need to be aware of and uh, uh, that the policymakers need to uh, need to be pay, pay attention to. So uh, our topic is about uh, uh, improving education, and I think this is a good point because we uh, we are always on, on our way, and we found the social phenomena that uh, goes away from the original value of um, of its first place, and we want to uh, we want to study it, and I think it's something that uh, a scholar need to focus on. Although I'm not a scholar, I'm just uh, on my way to be a scholar. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Mm. Excellent, excellent. Okay. Thank you. So uh, thank, thank you so much. Um, so, so I think my 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 next uh, uh, question, and that's that's probably the the last question that I will ask you, because there's a there's another one by Fortini uh, for for Dongying uh, after this one, but I I think let me ask you one more question if that's okay, and I was also already alluding to this uh, earlier, so in your in your presentation or in your abstract rather. Uh, you were using the, the word neoliberalism actually twice. Uh, and as I said, uh, I was really uh, surprised uh, by that uh, because I always associate uh, neoliberalism with, with countries like US, uh, UK, and uh, Australia. Um, but um, I think you were uh, relating that uh, to um, extensive measurement, uh, you know, of a student's performance. And uh, I think it is all probably also of, of teachers' performance. So, so these, these metrics, uh, key performance indicators, they become uh, more and more important. Um, and uh, your topic is, of course, um, uh, the, the selection process uh, for admission into postgraduate uh, studies. Um, so could you um, elaborate uh, on this a little bit? And uh, could, could you also tell us why you chose uh, qualitative research over quantitative research? Yes, sure. Uh, first about the neoliberalism, I think uh, uh, in the process of analyzing the data, I found that uh, it is quite interesting because I think neoliberalism is not a specific uh, thing that happens in a particular country such as UK and USA, but rather than um, it is a phenomenon that um, a society can be affected by this kind of theory. Uh, I think um, now it's the first time that the role of market principles is found in the field of education. Uh, I worked with my supervisor in the graduate study on, on uh, discourse study. And uh, uh, in my interviews, I could say uh, many discourses such as uh, the market 
discourse, management discourse, educational discourse, and so on. And for example, uh, my interviews emphasize uh, the output and uh, the visualization of learning, uh, such as ranking, uh, number of paper published, uh, and so on. And uh, this perfect seeking uh, force uh, treated its each person as a self interest self interested person, uh, and um, that's why I uh, I use neoliberalism to summarize this phenomena. Um, big, uh, and in my research, uh, I think um, everyone's language contain a power. Uh, contain a, a, a specific power, uh, such as um, we, 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 we both know the uh, pursuing perfects maybe, and uh, or we can also uh, do things for our own interest and the way influenced by other uh, discourses uh, and some sentences uh, maybe uh, very, clear to, to us, such as progress, competitive pressure, achievement, uh, and other concept. Uh, and uh, some, some, some students also say, uh, uh, said that they need to be, uh, to be a stand, uh, stand out of uh, all the student and they need to gather the uh, scholarship award and uh, go to the master uh, un uh, university. And they treat this role as a tool, um, which lead to leads you to the uh, successful role. So uh, I think uh, the student label, lab label themselves as a top student so that they pursue excellent grade and academic, academic rankings. Um, and they think that's the only way uh, they will win. And uh, for my, uh, for, uh, for my, um, a research mindset. I think, uh, for, uh, first of all, I use uh, quantitative mindset. Uh, this is because I um, want to uh, use my research to explore uh, more self uh, description of their own motivation uh, of the student, uh, why they learn, why they choose to be recommended for master's study. And uh, the real influence on the motivation to learn um, will be obtained by my research. Uh, although I'm aware that my research is still rather superficial and this is my uh, research limitation, I also hope to improve myself through this uh, dissertation training. And I really like quantitative research because uh, like uh, um, uh, grounded theory research, I can, I can use this research to, uh, to elaborate more, more, more than the outcomes uh, to, to, to discover more uh, of the uh, participants. And uh, of course, uh, of course uh, it also uh, need to be said that the, um, the, the number is useful for, for, for my research because we also need to represent uh, by numbers. It's much more clearly for us, but I think um, it, it, it's not the same because we, if we need to dig more from the data uh, we interviewed by another uh, participant, we need to maybe mix or maybe need to be uh, to do the quantitative research to, to, to explore more. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that sounds uh, great. And I think you are being uh, too humble. Uh, your, your research uh, really uh, sounds uh, extremely uh, interesting to me. So Fotini uh, has a question for uh, Dong Ying, uh, and uh, she's asking, uh, can you give some uh, specific examples uh, how um, Nanyang Technological University has uh, strengthened uh, innovation practice and cooperation? Yeah, uh, I'm briefly uh, inter introduction. Okay, uh, NTU's experts and the scholars from different disciplines um, made the joint effort to carry out interdisciplinary research, explore, explore the transmission of mechanism of barriers. Uh, the, uh, what's more, the experts and the scholars established a mathematical model uh, on global scale to observe and explore the spread uh, of barriers. 
just to learn about this. Okay. Excellent. Um, I think we are we are almost uh, out of time, <laughs> but uh, let me let me just uh, try to wrap this up. So, so I think uh, two really uh, very interesting uh, abstracts um, about um, Singapore, uh, the the example of a, of a very good university there, and uh, also the example of a, of another great university, uh, Beijing uh, Normal University, uh, in China. And um, we, we, I think we have only scratched uh, the surface and uh, there is uh, obviously a lot more uh, to explore. So yeah, I would certainly be, be interested in, in, in finding out uh, a lot more about um, uh, both uh, researchers, uh, but I pass it over to our chairwoman, uh, Madam President. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, uh, and uh, congratulations to, this, uh, to, to the two very courageous uh, students. And even if we had some technical uh, problems, uh, this was an excellent uh, uh, exchange, uh, roundtable session. And uh, so, so now we will have a, a, a lunch break, and we will start again at uh, two o'clock uh, Greek time. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, and see you in uh, about an hour and a half.